Hi, I'm Melissa Cobb, come fly with AOPA. This week we're going to talk about recovering from a wake turbulence upset, an amazing Red Bull feat, and more threats to 100 low lead popping up across the country. All right, well, let's hop inside the cockpit of an extra 300, and we're going to get turned upside down and see if we can recover from a wake turbulence upset. So can a pilot who's had some limited exposure to upset recovery training actually recover from an upset unexpectedly? What we did was we went in the extra. Tyler had had one flight in the extra with me, and we did some upset recovery, and we did some basic aerobatics. So we jumped in the extra again, and we took off behind a caravan, and we joined up on the caravan. We also had a 182 flying photo chase for us. And once we got behind the caravan, we tried to circle around and find where the wake turbulence was. And once we found it, though, we got some we got some pretty good upset. Right about right in here. Lee, we're coming forward to your three nine. All right, Tyler, recover. Roger, in tight. We're in a recovery. All right, my airplane. All right, your airplane. I think I definitely pulled there at first without detection. I think so. Yeah. Natural reaction. Yeah. That was my reaction. Yeah. What's great about this, uh, doing this, I wish everybody could see it, is it happens so quickly. Yeah. You got this startle factor. We're at 45, and I think we dropped down to probably 35 there. Yeah. Okay. Recover. We're in the recovery. All right, nice job, I got it. Oh, you got it? I think I need to be coming back quicker on the power. Yeah, I would, as soon as you find yourself nose low, yeah. then you, you know, your first step is power back, unload, roll to the horizon, Okay. right? And then you come back with power in as you begin to recover. Okay. All right, let's see if we can find it. Keep rolling, keep rolling, very nice. Now recover. Very nice. <laughs> that was a beautiful demo. All, nose all the way above the horizon, so you're climbing again. Okay. And power back up. Very nice. Thanks. Yeah, that was a nice recovery, Tyler. What, yeah, I, loved, what I loved about that was, that was something you've never seen before. No. That was pretty severe, my airplane. <laughs> Your airplane. That was pretty severe, and it was rolling, and you had to keep with the roll the worst thing you could have done there was to try to uh, snatch it out of that roll, and you didn't. That was well done on your part. I, I felt like I wanted to try to snatch it out of that roll. I'm glad you said something because it, it, it helped, you know, got me back into reality. You know, I can't do that. Recover. Was that all right? I felt. I felt like I was doing something wrong there. A little, you were a little bit slow in the in the response there, I thought. So remember, when the nose gets low, you're just going to power back, unload, and roll to the nearest horizon. Okay. Right? We're going to come in and try that again. Roger, how's your fuel state? That's uh, good, thanks. I got three quarters, got uh, three quarters of the fuel flight there, so a lot of time. Nice job. Very thanks. nice. I think the very first time we got into an upset, uh, I still really had to fight that urge to pull the nose back. It, yeah. I think I had to, I think I, I quickly uh, went to do that and then realized, no, I, you can't do that. You got to push. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and then from there on, I think I, I was more able to, to have that immediate response each time. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I saw the same thing as the instructor in the back. The first time you saw it, you were a little slow in the response to that. Mm -hmm. And the initial response was to kind of pull back because that's our that tends to be a natural response. And one of the things you learn in upset recovery is that you actually have to push. You want to push and unload the aircraft and then roll to the nearest horizon, mm -hmm. which uh, in subsequent times you were doing really well. So um, I, I thought that was definitely something a learning curve that we saw uh, mm -hmm. a progression. Not it wasn't to me. It wasn't extensive. Like even on the first one, you were eventually there. It just took that extra second or so. Right, right. But yeah, I think it. Um, I think it would have taken certainly even longer. Or I might. I may not have known what to do at all had we not had that previous flight under our belt. Because it's still. It, it's such a natural instinct to want to pull back that you really have to fight. So, 
um, you know, I, I had to be cognizant of that. And, and yeah, re really having that extra, for the flight prior to that, uh, just kind of helped me know what to do in that situation. So I think this flight reinforced the value of upset recovery training and periodic upset recovery training. So Tyler had some exposure to it, which was good. And we heard him say that without that, he isn't sure he would have known what to do. And I, I, that's what I've seen from people. So the initial exposure to it, so you can get rid of that startle factor if it ever happens to you, it's not the first time you've seen it and you know what to do. And then to periodically have the chance to go do it again so you can reinforce sort of that muscle memory and the actions you need to take. This definitely underscores the importance of upset recovery training. Now the extra that we used in this video is actually gonna be open for auction. Bidding is gonna start on March 20th on aircraftbidder.com. Uh, you can check it out if you're interested in bidding. The proceeds are going to go to benefit AOPA's initiatives to protect general aviation. All right, well, I'd like to touch base with you on the top four news stories you might be talking about out at your hangar at the airport this weekend. And the first one is the Red Bull Air Race pilot and Cub Crafters Carbon Cum owner who landed a modified tail dragger on a helipad on top of a 56-story hotel in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Now, Red Bull and Cub Crafters worked with Mike Patey. You might remember him as the builder of Draco and Scrappy, those monster bush planes. Um, he helped modify the aircraft specifically for this mission. So what are your thoughts on the Red Bull feat? Just drop us a comment in the notes below. All right, the next one is the Reno Air Racing Association has announced that the Steel National Championship Air Races are no longer going to be held at the Reno Stead Airport in Nevada after this year's event in September. Now, the races have wowed crowds for nearly 60 years. The future of the event is uncertain, but the Racing Association has said that it's, quote, committed to preserving and growing this great event. Let's certainly hope they can. Okay, number three on the list, general aviation pilots in CalDART. So that's a group in California, and they organize disaster air transportation services, uh, and they fly out and take life-saving supplies after natural disasters have hit. They have been in action since the blizzard at the end of February hit the San Bernardino Mountain area really hard and delivering supplies. They have been getting lots of positive coverage in California for what they are doing. Now, CalDART prepares for events like this throughout the year, and they, they host uh, these drills at different airports in California, so they're ready when this kind of thing happens. We have a link to their website in the description below, so you can check out more about them if you'd like to get involved. A number four, the Air Safety Institute has released an early analysis on the tragic accident in Winter Haven, Florida recently it's between a Piper Warrior operating in the pattern at the Winter Haven Airport and a J-3 Cub on floats at Jack Brown Seaplane Base. All four people on board were killed. Now, Air Safety Institute Senior Vice President Richard McSpadden walks through the accident in an early analysis and provides lessons that we can learn from it, including recommendations such as separating the patterns and operation areas in that area a little bit more. You can watch the full early analysis on the Air Safety Institute's YouTube channel. Uh, we'll drop a link to that in the description below. And we just want to express our sincere condolences to the entire aviation community affected by these tragic losses. Well, on the advocacy front, AOPA is fighting a bill in Washington state that would ban the sale and distribution of 100 low-lead avgas by 2026. Now, AOPA has already been working with the government and the aviation industry, working on getting switched to an unleaded fuel for the entire fleet by 2030. We fully support the transition to an unleaded fuel, but AOPA really stresses we've got to do it in a safe smart manner. And so I have asked AOPA Vice President of Airports and State Advocacy, Mike Ginter, to bring us up to speed on this bill, as well as uh, AOPA's efforts on the unleaded fuel front. Mike, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Alyssa. And uh, you're right, we're all working towards a smart and safe transition nationwide. So uh, the regional managers and the airport advocacy team are uh, paying close attention to what's going on in the state legislatures 
And this year we had a bill introduced in Washington State. It was House Bill 1554, and our regional manager, Brad Schuster, was working it aggressively. But that bill proposed to restrict the sale of leaded avgas starting in 26, way ahead of the Eagle uh, goal of 2030. Now, we all know we're making great progress, and we probably will get there sooner, but uh, we did everything we could to remove those lead restrictions uh, by lobbying in the state capitol in uh, Washington State, and, and we were successful in removing those restrictions. And it was because we partnered with the, uh, the desires of the legislators to remove the lead. We, we wanted to uh, get to the same goal, but we advocated for an incentive approach rather than a, pen a penalty approach. So that, uh, that was a very successful lobbying effort by Brad Schuster, and uh, that's happening in other states as well. But uh, we got that removed, and the bill continued in early February with uh, very serious restrictions on airport managers, airport operators, that put very onerous restrictions on how they would uh, manage and regulate leaded uh, avgas handling at the airports to include up to a $10,000 a day fine if if, if their plans weren't uh, adhered to. So we switched our advocacy to, restri to, to opposing that, and we succeeded very well. And I must say, Alyssa, it was with the help of a big coalition of aviation organizations in Washington State, uh, not the least of which was Washington State Aviation Alliance with their president, John Dobson, and, and the Washington Airport Management Association, and their friends of Boeing Field, and there was a Washington Pilots Association. We had a great coalition and we really got the word out to our members up there, our collective members, and they started calling their representatives. And, and Alyssa, that's what moves the needle in the state capitals. All right. Well, that's a great win. Now, can you tell us what's happening elsewhere in the country, this pressure for, you know, the quick transition to an unleaded fuel and, and what's AOPA doing? Sure. Uh, so we have a very similar bill in New Mexico that we're aggressively fighting. That's being handled by Tom Chandler, our Central Southwest Regional Manager. And, uh, and there's also, uh, I'm sure our members are aware of, there's plenty of local uh, initiatives like we all know about in Santa Clara County. But we're seeing that in a few other areas around the country. And we are working very aggressively to get in ahead of any decisions. And we are generally having success. But let me tell you that it's a it's an increasing, uh, the size of the fight is increasing. So we're very uh, uh, aggressive about getting on those, those issues and trying to beat it. Okay. And yeah, something, as you mentioned, we are working at every level, working at the national level, the state level, yeah. and even at local airport level. So thank you and all our regional managers for all you're doing to uh, keep us safe. Thank you, Alyssa. Well, finally, this week, we bring you the inspiring story of Ashwinia Huja. My name is Ash, Ash Ahuja. Been flying for about 13 years now. I got my sport pilot license 13 years ago and been flying ever since, but only recently only got my own plane, so flying a lot more now. My dad was in the Air Force in India, so I grew up around planes all my life. So I always wanted to be a pilot. That's what I would have wanted to do, be either a test pilot or join the Air Force as well. Uh, but when I was about 11, I got paralyzed, so, so that got shot, but uh, still, I got my pilot's license the first uh, instance I could find someone who would train me and find a plane that I could fly. So I got my pilot's license in uh, New Jersey, this place called Philly Sport Pilot. They had a Sky Arrow, which was an Italian light sport aircraft. It's a tandem uh, two-seater with uh, hand controls that are built in by the factory. It's one of the few planes that had factory-built hand controls. And uh, Sean, who was running, who just started that uh, flight school, I was their first wheelchair pilot to graduate in three months right after they opened up. Philly Sport Pilot provides their Sky Arrow to Able Flight, which is the largest uh, wheelchair training and scholarships organization in the US. They graduate, I think, about 10 to 12 wheelchair pilots a year. I just use the same plane. I didn't go through Able Flight or the scholarship program. Uh, but that's an amazing, amazing organization. One of the biggest requirements for me for buying a plane that was not the Sky Arrow, in fact, I love the Sky Arrow, but it's so small that you can't carry the wheelchair in it. I was looking for a plane that had enough baggage area that I could actually take my wheelchair in and actually go places. So the way this, uh, the hand controls work are, 
this is the rudder that they installed. So basically you move it back and forth. It's harder right now because the plane is on the ground. But this does the rudder and steering on the ground. When you twist it, it does the throttle. As you can see, it moves the actual throttle itself, so just connected. So basically you have your right hand on the rudder and the throttle constantly. And it's a regular, it's a regular yoke for the, uh, for the ailerons and the elevator. Uh, the other thing that they installed is these two differential hand brakes. So you can either pull them together or you do differential braking. It still has the regular rudders and tow brakes on both sides. So pilots who don't need the hand controls just ignore them and they can fly on both sides with the regular controls as well. So getting used to the paradise was really having me to rewire my entire brain of left, right controls, different hands doing different things. So that's taken a bit of time and I'm, I've been flying with a CFI here, uh, Taylor, who's amazing. I have my certificate, but I wanted to have a CFI as I'm learning the plane and rewiring my brain and getting used to the hand controls. Just a whole bunch of new things uh, having to learn. I wanted to find a used paradise because it's almost half the price and try and get the controls retrofitted. So I found uh, this company in Deland, Florida. Alex Rolensky uh, runs the company and he had a paradise and he said, if you want to buy this, we'll do the, we'll do the hand controls, install for, and get the controls from paradise themselves. And uh, I went to Florida a couple of times to see how they were doing it. And then finally went to Florida in November and then uh, flew the plane back from uh, Florida to California with Alex. That was an amazing trip. It took us uh, about three days and about a couple of hours. We ran into some weather, had to divert, take some time off in cities that nobody had heard of. Flying through areas like Texas, which took a whole day just to cover Texas. And then flying over New Mexico was really amazing because that's when we got into this game of pulling up Zillow and looking up the prices of homes in the middle of nowhere. So we just had this game going on where every time we would fly over a region, we'd like, how much is the house there? How much is that land there? So we just kept doing Zillow flying and I would love to do it again for some, you know, a few times. I would highly recommend it. After I'd completed the trip, I talked to Charles who runs Able Flight and to see if um, there are other wheelchair pilots who've actually done a cross country. And he said, no, actually, this is the first time I've heard of an accessible control plane to have flown coast to coast with a wheelchair pilot. So well, that felt good. I'm the first one to actually do it in the US. Uh, I'm sure there'll be many more, but at least this was the first time I did it. So that's good. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Fly with AOPA. Be sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date on all our latest videos. And we leave you with some fun footage from viewer Edward, and it's of he and his wife on a flyabout around Pennsylvania. And be sure to send in your favorite flying videos at the link in the description. You just might see them on an upcoming show. And as always, if you're not already an AOPA pilot, we'd love to have you join us. Just click the link at the end of this video. We'll see you next week.